that's on the planet today has won all kinds of awards and accolades. And, uh, and most importantly for us, he was uh, has well connected to our soon to be retiring Mr. Ed Peterson. So how about, how about if it occurred to him? Uh, thank you. Um, I kind of think of myself as, as a guy who just wanted something badly enough and then just stuck with it really hard and worked really hard and tried not to be a dick to people and tried to learn stuff and so I didn't go to music school. Um, when I was working with Ed, I had crapped out of graduate school and I had been reading the philosophy of religion at the University of Chicago because I was trying to figure that whole thing out. And you can't really. <laughs> you can figure out a lot more music than you can figure out philosophy for, for, for sure and nail it down because you can tell if it sounds really good. And the only thing that you can tell about philosophy is if you feel better. So it's no matter how much you try to intellectualize stuff, you more or less have to come to some kind of understanding between yourself and life. And that can't really be codified in the same way, except through action. So music too, your love of music is codified through action, how much you practice, how deeply you listen, how much you pay attention to the incredible examples that have come before and respect that and respect it for a long time more than the thing you feel that you want to say or do yourself. And even later on, even these days, I continue to go back to the great recordings of people who've been dead a long time because they played so beautifully. And I don't find the same intensity of emotion in a lot of contemporary approaches. I'm not a big math guy. There are guys, people, there are people who write really great uh, grant proposals and come up with very enormous mental architectural cathedrals of things uh, and that can be it can be really great it's a substantial accomplishment sure to do that intellectually but I don't know if it has as much feeling Ed knows me from to get to call you Ed everybody does right it's pretty mellow right okay so I was just a guy who had fallen in love with stuff and like I say I had I had crapped out of graduate school and I was doing wedding dates and singing rock lobster and uh, whatever you had to sing in those days whatever Disney romantic thing had to happen and Phantom of the Opera and and it was great experience because I was on stage not on stage on stage but you know playing and meeting cats and um, a lot of the a lot of the guys who went through went through my band went through my who I was learning from by hiring them <laughs> who I was learning from by getting them to write arrangements for me or whatever I met them because I was doing wedding dates or I met them because I was uh, sitting in with Ed's band um, and Ed is one of the cats that I very very routinely acknowledge in interviews that set an incredibly high standard for for me, for anybody he came into contact with. The guys on the Chicago scene knew that that band was one of the hardest working bands, not in terms of the number of dates that they played, but the hardest working in terms of the musicianship that you had to master. Cats would shed, I would shed really hard to be ready for that gig. And you, you know, me especially, because as a singer, ah, uh, you know, <laughs> the reedy stuff was not that strong. 
And so, you know, either Ed would demo up a thing for me and I'd listen to it a million times and get it in the ear and try to get it under a little bit and figure out some tricks I could play. It was another in a long string of gigs where I had to figure out, oh no, I can't swim. And now I better swim really fast, otherwise I'm gonna drown. Um, so I would figure stuff out. It's you know, between that and just making mistakes in public and trying to be graceful about tripping over yourself. That's kind of half my career, I think. Um, and the other half is, like I say, falling in love with it and really wanting it and chasing John Hendricks down a hallway and getting him to be, you know, I mean, he, he, he didn't take any encouraging, you know. Uh, you just had to ask a question or two and he would start and then you just had to listen and dig it. Um, or Mark Murphy or Sheila Jordan, or Andy Bay, or, you know, the people who were around when I, when I was younger, um, Joe Williams and Betty Carter, and I would just tap them every chance I could for any information I could, and what was it like to be around Bird, and what did you learn? But beyond, like, this riff or that riff, what was it like to be alive? That always seemed to be pretty important to me. Um, and of course, those people are, fewer and fewer, so you want to chase them faster and faster. So I didn't go to music school. My father was a church musician, so I grew up doing sort of the Bach motets, um, and we would do them, three or four of them, at the same time every year in the church calendar. So I would sing soprano a bunch of years, and then I sang alto, and then I got to sing tenor, and I couldn't wait to get to bass, because that's where the action is, I think. But it gave me a sense of counterpoint, and it gave me a sense of how things fit together, um, and it gave me a very, very, very early sense of feeling the music, uh, technically and emotionally, to sing in tune, to have enough breath to finish a line, to sing with a very strong sense of diction, uh, and my, my father, very uh, fortunately for me, was big on dynamics. He was big on, as we say, not gestures, not, not shapes in the music, because that's a static idea, right? Gestures in the music, because it moves through time, and it moves through space, so it's in motion by nature. He had a very strong sense of all those things, and again, fortunately for me, a very strong sense of kind of a deeper purpose of music and how it changes the way the musician feels and how it can change the way people who are listening feel. You feel better, you feel healed, you work together, you're in it together. Everybody, there's a corporate, there's a common sense of everything. And if you play it right, then you feel even better, better. And so does everybody else too. And as a singer, there's a specific story. I often think that on the occasions when I write lyrics for people, for, for people's tunes that are instrumental compositions, if it's like a Wayne Shorter thing, in a way, I'm sort of stealing from the possibilities. You know, when Wayne plays for people, one of the reasons why people have such an emotional reaction, and this, I, this is true to varying degrees of anybody who's playing an instrument and, and not singing a specific story, is that you can hear it and you are affected in the way that you're affected somebody next to you has a different story, has a different emotional impact. It hits them in a different part. Their heart is open in a different way, or their mind is open, or they were reading a book and they've got something in their head and it connects and it goes to them. So I, I feel like Wayne is kind of like a bodhisattva. He's a spirit who, he, if there's anybody I've met as a musician who was really close to Nirvana and could have gone and decided to come back again to broadcast 
peace and, and adventure and childlike wonder and benediction. and Because uh, I get that every time from him, and I see the reaction in the audiences when, when that happens, because he's so powerful with two notes. And then I come along and I say, oh, well, this song is actually about this really specific hyper-intellectualized thing. I don't know. But it's a, it's the gift I've been given a little bit to want to write those things and to have something to say. I think sometimes a little bit, and it's not always totally inscrutable. Um, and Wayne's blessed it, and you know, the different cats that I've been able to write for, they've been real sweet about it and kind, and I've kind of gotten away with it. And because I can sing in tune most of the time, that's pretty good. They don't mind that. Um, Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Uh, here's a couple things I want to say. I, uh, I, I'm going to want to hear somebody else sing and talk and everything. Uh, you know, you want to say, are there other singers? Are there other singers? A couple singers? And so if you guys feel like it, I'd love to hear you and work with you because that's a good thing. Uh, and whoever plays piano and junk and stuff too, how we work together because there's so much. Most of the stuff I've learned by experience uh, and being in front of crowds and stuff. And so maybe I can help out a little bit with that. Uh, also, questions about anything is cool. Uh, meanwhile, too much talk. Mm, let's see if I get my B flat one. Mm, I'm a half off. That's from getting up at four in the morning. Five, <laughs> five, I will tell that a rabbit will do good shots in Spain today. Yes, a sabbat of it will set that letter to Felios a spattle dead. Fa, 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 eat a double down to be the double dead. For Yeah, 
thing is to play all the time and to take every gig unless you've tried it already and it's really terrible <laughs> but try it first um, there's no getting around the, um, the fact that what you need most of anything is time in front of people trying to communicate with them um, making mistakes sounding shitty uh, and playing anyway and continuing and refining and listening back to your gigs and saying how shitty you sound and then practicing more and more and more and more and more. Um, I mean, I'm on the road 180 nights a year and um, I'm trying to figure stuff out every night. And um, the guys that I'm with, I try to hire people who are smarter than I am much as possible. Um, it's harder, getting harder to hire people older than I am. <laughs> That's harder to come by. Most of them I can't afford, uh, and the other ones aren't around. Um, but the guys I do, like I, I've got this kid in the band now, and he's 25, and he grew up in Chile, and he's got all these grooves I never heard of, and I can't find one, and it's beautiful and crazy. <laughs> And I can just say, man, I, uh, there's this piece of poetry I'd love to sing, I got no idea. And then he's like, a week later, how about this? Well, let's just record that the way you wrote it exactly then, because that's perfect. <laughs> um, I try to hire people smarter than me. Um, I, um, I try to have, uh, you know, I've always, I've, I guess I've always kind of had a point of view. I've always wanted to do something more unique. I've always felt like that was part of the history of what we're trying to do as jazz musicians, is to be individualists, and to be honest, and to bring who we really are and what we really have to say to people, but to do that by way of really having digested as much of the past and the greatest parts of the past as we can, so that it's, you're not just making stuff up whole cloth, because not, not any of us are smart enough to do that. Everything I, everything I think about when I'm thinking about how can I make my thing better is over my shoulder, you know? It's stuff that somebody already sang better than me, and the only reason I can get away with some amount of things that I do is because I'm writing. And that automatically gives you a leg up, singers. The more you can write, the more, even if it's just lyrics to stuff, to set yourself apart. The songbook thing is a good learning tool, and it can be wonderful, but it's kind of a drag, because it's kind of played out, I think, in a lot of ways, unless you can juxtapose it with other things. That's the thing. Most of creativity isn't really making up new things. It's juxtaposing two things that haven't been juxtaposed before. It's two things that nobody thought of went together, and now, oh, that works. Wow, I didn't know that worked, those two things. Actual creativity, there's a tiny, tiny amount. Most of it's something that goes here and something that's from over back here, and suddenly you can see the one way that they work or that they enlighten each other which is why the stuff with Ed's band was so important to me because he was bringing this intense uh, compositional, what, magnitude, and there weren't any lyrics on any of it, but there were these great titles for things, and deeply astonishing musicianship from everybody he had on the stand, and so it was more for me to just interact with that, and since I had read so many books, and I had thought, trying to have been thinking about things, and trying to get something happening, and have enough imagination to creatively put myself in the past or in 
left field or wherever, then I could say something, I could come out with something that he thought was cool and that, you know, kind of worked in that situation. If I had just come on and sung and not had any words to do anything, eh, I probably wouldn't have had as many nights with the band. Because I really was just trying to, I was just grabbing it and going and jumping off. Because I, like I say, I didn't have any of that training. So it was just, where can I put this? So because I could sing with words, because I could extemporaneously make up poetic things, uh, because I could um, also do vocalese things, then it was like, oh, okay, well that's something we can work with. Let's see what that leads to. And that was kind of my small thing I could add to the mix of the band. Find your small thing that you can add to the mix of the band. Yeah? Before we get singers, does anybody have a question about anything? Because I'm done talking about myself. Could, I'm going to ask you about yourself. Sorry. <laughs> could you talk about how you started writing lyrics? Like, had you written poetry before? Or? I hadn't. I hadn't. It was, a, it was kind of a crazy thing. Um, I don't remember how I got turned on to what Lambert Henderson Ross was doing, um, but I did. And then I listened to as much of that stuff as I could find. And, and you've got to remember, this is before internet, so everything was like 75 cent records in a secondhand store. And if they didn't have that band, then where would you go? Because Tower Records or whatever, they didn't have the old stuff, blah, 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 blah. And I was broke. But I listened to as much as I could, and I tried to cop as much as I could, and I loved it for what it was already without really understanding what it was that John had done by writing all those lyrics. So it wasn't until I was, I was kind of like listening backwards and like, oh, Horace Silver, blah, blah, blah. And then you put on, and it's like, oh, that's the tune. Oh, that's the solo. So I had fallen in love with the whole lyrical singing aspect of that part of jazz history without knowing, oh, John is taking these great instrumental solos and writing lyrics for them. And as soon as I, as soon as that happened, then I'm like, oh, well that means now, that means I could take this Dexter Gordon solo that I've always loved and I can at least try to do a thing with that, and then I could sing that incredible solo that I've always wanted to sing in front of people, and it was just the hugest kind of, uh, I was just joyful that there was an answer to the question, where did he get all this in, these incredible lines to sing, to write lyrics for? And as soon as it was that, then I'm like, well now I can, I can sing this Lester Young thing, I can sing this Dexter Gordon thing, I can sing, this John Coltrane thing, and it's it's legit because these guys did it, and they're clearly masters and old people and jazz people, and, and so it's <laughs> let's do that. And I think it was probably that week that I wrote, or at least got halfway through or something, writing whatever that was on the first record. Tiny Jean. No, the other the first one that I wrote was um, the clouds. Those clouds are heavy. The little um, what's the guy's name? He worked with Dave Brubeck, uh, the saxophone guy, <laughs> Paul Desmond, which is perfect because it stuff is all so lyrical. It's all just singing, and there's no math involved. It's just beautiful melody. And I and because it was a discreet little thing, I'm like, well, let's do. And then I think within a couple of weeks, I had that one, and it just came out real fast. Uh, and then I'm, okay, well now I got something I can peg my brain to and go down a road with. And then and then when I and then I had a nice apartment by myself. And that's when I wrote the Tanya Jean one, because I had because I wasn't just living in a guy's basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the John Hendricks thing has been huge. Um, and I I feel really grateful that I was able to express to him how much that meant and how much it changed my world and to have him embrace me and call me his son and everything like that is just epically beautiful so yeah yeah I have a question this is more of a business question I guess and um, looking back on your early part of your career before you had a lot of notoriety and you know, you're still struggling you know to call places to get gigs or whatever is, is there anything that you can think about that, that happen that sort of puts you over, made things easier? 
nothing. Was it, a, was it a recording contract? Was it no. A I mean, or? yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, getting signed to Blue Note was huge. Hmm. Um, let me put it this way: the way I got from the guy's basement apartment and being broke to having an apartment and being on Blue Note and getting a thing happening, which by the which which was no e yeah, okay. To get from there I just I just put my Johnny Hustle on. I would hit with Ed whenever he asked. I I had a whole circuit of gigs I would go to. On Tuesday night I would go to the new apartment lounge and hit with Von Freeman. On Wednesday at six o'clock uh, Eddie Johnson had a session for these old swingers, man, these old swinging like cats who, I mean, it was, you know, John Young and, and George Hughes and those cats, like swing era cats, so I would go down and hit with them. You know, Monday was Ed's band, I would go, even not to sing, just to listen, I would just go and check it out because it was so epic. Um, and then by the time Thursday came around, there was either a session session someplace, or I would go down to Jazz Showcase and find out whoever was hitting, who was from out of town. And then, you know, the Green Mill had sessions to sit. So anyway, so that's just the sitting in part. Then I went to Kinko's and I made a little press kit with a, a friend took photos and and I made a cassette thing and I made up a bunch of quotes to put in from non-existent newspapers or whatever. And I went around. And I went around from door to door to every every spot, you know. At the time there you know those you know like the you know, the town will have like a free newspaper with all the art stuff in it. So I just went to every club that I thought might have a jazz night and I would go with my little kinko package meet the manager at two in the afternoon and shake his or her hand and say, hey, you know, I, I, I know I, you don't know me from anybody, but here you go. And, you know, and nine times out of 10, the stuff would be in the waste can before I left the room. But, every, you know, one time out of 10, somebody would say, yeah, well, come on in or whatever. And I, and I also went to a lot of restaurants even where they didn't already have music, and I said, hey man, you know, I know you don't need this, but I would be willing to come in with a friend who plays guitar, and the two of us could just be over here in the corner, and it would be real nice, and I wouldn't do any weird stuff, <laughs> and you could just try it out on a Tuesday and see if you like it, and you know, we'll just do it for an hour on a Tuesday. If you like it, we come back the next week, you buy us dinner, you like it the next week, you give us 10 bucks or something. And we, and there were certain restaurants where I got a pretty good amount of work because the guys had, what would you call it? They respected what I was trying to do and they would say, oh man, yeah, that's actually kind of nice and let me give you 50 bucks. And then, so you know, and so by the time the Blue Note thing came around, I was working eight nights out of a, out of a, eight, nine, ten nights out of a month, and because I was living so cheap, <laughs> then it was, it was all gravy and it was really exciting. So the bump with Blue Note happened because I could see as I looked in the jazz magazines or whatever, it's like, well, there's a hole. There's nobody doing this under age 70. There's nobody doing the thing that I want to do under age 70. I mean, there's Kevin Mahogany, and then there was this kind of like empty area. And I knew at the time how fortunate an opportunity that was for me. It's, and, I, and I wanted to be that guy more than anything else. I wanted to be the guy who came on and kind of filled that hole and, and made a thing happen that way. Um, so we went into the studio and I borrowed 10 grand and you know, none of it was automated, so we lost some mixes overnight because the guy blah blah with the thing, and then we had to remix everything. And there was no isolation booth, and I was a shit singer, and ugh, stuff I didn't know, and guys' egos in the band, and uh, negotiating and who's going to take a solo on a thing, and what, who belongs to. Uh, 
And I just threw myself in, and I said, well, at least I'll have a cassette to sell at these restaurant gigs for five bucks. Or maybe I'll give, a, I'll give one to somebody and they'll have me into their house and I'll sing for their daughter's wedding or something. And that cassette, with nine tunes, started traveling around. I mean, I gave it to all my musician friends. And Fred Simon, who is uh, still in Chicago, he's a, a composer, um, piano guy. Um, he had a, what was his thing? It was Simon and Bard, right? Um, like, you know, electronic uh, melodies. But he had, he had had a kind of a peak, and he's like, oh, my manager out in Los Angeles, you should get in touch with him. So, send him out. He's like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll represent you for $500 an hour. And then he heard this cassette, and he's like, I don't want your money until I get you a deal. I don't want anything. I just, I mean, I want it all, but I don't want to charge you by the hour. I want this to be like, I'm going to manage you, you're going, okay. <laughs> and we mailed it around, and we mailed the cassette around, and Bruce Lundvall gives me a call on a Tuesday morning or something after your gig, and he's, oh, is this Kurt Alley? Yeah. Bruce Lundvall, blue, blue Note Records, well, well, lad, how are you? This is for battle. I'm calling you from my phone, from my phone in the car, and I'm on my way to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> what are you playing next? Uh, on, on Monday with Ed, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and it was our demo. They and they and they gave us they gave me enough money that they said well you need to put some standards on now so give us four standards and then we recorded four standards and they put out the demo basically they licensed the demo and and then we got uh, you know blah blah so but so then but you had the, the manager before Blue Note because I never I had, had the manager time. because I would have never thought I'll send this to Blue Note yeah but I mean, those, <laughs> at that time most things have changed a lot since then but at that time it, it was always. It seemed like with those kind of companies, the bigger companies, they wouldn't take you seriously unless you had managed. At least that was that was the situation with me. But I I don't know how they usually did anything. Yeah. <laughs> and was, so 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 nowadays, what would you what would you since we're kind of yeah past this, this yeah this sure recording big recording company, well being discovered by big recording company, what would you tell young aspiring musicians? well the same I would say the same thing. I mean you know get go out and manufacture gigs for yourself and play as many gigs as you can and come up with a thing just on the local scene. Just focus on the local scene and, and getting as much work as you can and you'll become a better musician and you'll get known for who you are and you know the city if, the, if, if you get a whole city in love with you or what feels like that and you're working all the time you're doing better than 90% of the musicians anyway so the whole like shooting for the stars thing, you can't control that, or at least you can't control it where you are right now. What you can control is, are you playing as often as you can for as many people as you can, as well as you can? And are you on a path that you feel really strongly, you know, uh, is gonna uh, build up your musical abilities so that w when a thing comes around, you're ready for it. Because you know, the only thing that, I shouldn't say the only thing that happened with the Blue Note gig, but the chief thing that happened was, okay, they put it out, but nobody still knew who I was in Cleveland or LA or not even New York or anything. It's, it was, you know, who's this totally unknown guy? I don't care who this totally, so, we came up with a plan to work these other cities in the same way that I worked Chicago. We had the we had somebody else making the phone calls this time, but I came to New York and we did this thing called 40 Days and 40 Nights where we took every conceivable gig in every crazy location. We took the, yeah, we, we had a night in, uh, at Birdland, but we also had a night in the rodeo bar and in some club above where a comedy show happened and a place called La Bar Bat that was all decorated like Halloween all the time <laughs> and 
you know, rooms, joints, where not even it wasn't necessarily a jazz thing. And downtown in some no-name club in a basement for 30 people or, 20, or 10 people or whatever. And I worked with you know, 20 different rhythm sections out of New York. So I got to meet a bunch of New York guys in short order. I had to rehearse my ass off because every day it was a different rhythm section. And we played a different room. And that was its own story for the press in as much as there was, you know, there's a lot more jazz press then than there is now. But I guarantee if somebody comes around, people are gonna notice who's this person. My point is, the same Johnny Hustle that got me the thing happening in Chicago was the same thing that got the whole, now I'm doing 180 nights a year and I've got too many miles on United and it's driving me crazy. Because it's a self perpetu it's a, the machinery starts going and if you already have this mindset of trying to create business for yourself, when it comes in and a call comes in, you still want to say yes because you don't want it to not be there. You know, and I don't have a teaching gig any place, so this is it for me. I'm out, I hit with cats, I try to, you know, and this is an off year for me. Because for me what happens is you put a record out, six months, you know, you, you make the record, six months later, you, you start touring, you do the, you hope you get good reviews, you, you hope your reputation is enough that you can line up enough dates to keep something going, tour the music, and then a year and a half goes by, and that thing is kind of toured out, and your overhead is making your bottom line suffer because you got to pay the four or five people in the band, and and off the top comes the percentage for the agent, and off the top comes the airline fees and whatever. Um, so then it's like, oh, time to start thinking about another record. Now I start taking the money dates where I go out with an orchestra. It's just me. With a big band, it's just me. The overhead is nothing now. So whatever the cheese is comes home, so it replenishes the coffers so I can go again. <coughs> <laughs> Which is its own form of exhaustion at 52 years old. Man, can I feel it. That's the other thing, is that you want to work as hard as you can now. <laughs> while you have energy. You want to learn as much as you can now while your brain is flexible before you get encrusted. Uh, you want to hit it as hard as you can while you have the energy to do it. You can't waste time with anything that's not substantial, uh, in my opinion. That was my opinion for myself. I couldn't waste time with anything that was not, once I decided this was a thing, I couldn't waste time on anything that was not substantially related to this. Which means that your skill sets in your other parts of your life are going to take a hit. I can't balance a checkbook. Uh, my wife won't let me in charge. I mean, I come home with them and I sort of open the door and I throw the money in. <laughs> I close the door and I wait for a while. <laughs> it so comes out. And I sort of peep my head in and if it seems like it's cool, then I come in. <laughs> and then I say, I'm sorry. And then it, it, it begins from there. Because um, I really only have a couple of marketable skills. Man. I just try to stick to those. Um, yes? Do you, uh, so you know, you're working all the time and you know, traveling a lot, so you probably, you know, like you said, you got up at four in the morning. What are some skills that you maybe use to help yourself uh, focus and get, get to the point of, being you as a musician? I, well, doing transcriptions, getting stuff under your fingers, as they say, listening as deeply as you can, you know, not leaving any stone unturned kind of thing. Um, because I didn't go to music school, I have just giant areas that are completely unmapped, uh, that I couldn't necessarily even codify. Um, and I feel like more of the time I'm, I feel like I, my musicianship suffers from that, but when I talk to people, I 
have a deep musical love and respect for, and I bring up my kind of uh, insecurity about things, then they're like, it wouldn't, they're talking just to me now. They're not talking to anybody else because everybody's on the path they're on. But for me, they're, I, I routinely get, you didn't need that, that wouldn't have helped you, you're better off because you took the route that you took. Um, thinking about people like Branford and Winton and thinking about uh, Benny Golson and, you know, cats, cats I have a, a heart thing with. Um, and I kind of say, well, I mean, okay, I sure wish I could write a chart. <laughs> no, get somebody to write a chart for you. It's fine. We, we, you, cause I, cause I mean, I can't explain what I want from a chart and I can say, oh, this needs another two bars or this needs to rest. Or when we get to that B flat, I want to hit it like this. So I can, I can talk orchestration and I can, re I can rehearse a band and I can do, you know, the stuff that a professional is supposed to be able to do. But the stuff I focused on is the show. And by that I mean, I used to, I used to almost write a script for myself for, mm, for my club appearances. Because the great recordings and the great experiences that I've had with great singers all contain a, a, a very strong aspect of relating to the audience in a naturally verbal way. Sometimes it's a little bit more codified and uh, buttoned down, and sometimes it's a little bit looser and whatever. But I mean, you know, Carmen McRae coming on and giving stank to the audience, that's part of the thing that you want. Or John coming on and explaining the thing in this regal way, or Joe Williams, or you know, whoever it was saying stuff. Tying it together, this is a heavy part of a thing that I think a lot of jazz singers, and more to the more significantly, even a lot of jazz instrumentalists don't have. It's because people used to come up, and before TV and whatever, the whole thing had to be entertaining, no matter what you were playing, and to keep people uh, engaged between songs, to keep them engaged in the songs, to keep the room lively, to, to, to keep their attention, to keep people's attention. You know, jazz is such a challenging music for the players, obviously. It's so challenging for the listeners. Even for jazz people to listen to jazz is hard. It's like, oh man, two, two tunes in and you're like, ah, yeah, I gotta take a break and you know, I'm gonna be back at the home and I'll see you in a minute. You know, you can go in and get a drink and come back because it's so much. So to be able to relate and, and, and have this kind of uh, rapport, to be able to establish a rapport, I tell, I tell singers the world over, you know, you, you kind of have to get to a place, you want to get to a place where you walk in a room and people go, oh, there, oh man, there, oh yeah, what's it, oh man, that's a cold coat. <laughs> I mean, right? That's kind of, the, that's as much of a star turn as you're gonna get as a jazz musician. You're not gonna get showing up in a limousine. You're not gonna get, you're on some television show. You're gonna get, oh, there he is, in the room. That's the way I feel even now. Like, Branford walks in, I'm like, oh, oh shit. You know? I, it, it's just, it's awesome. But that personal charisma doesn't have to do with what scales you can play or how dexterously you can make your way through rhythm changes, or how much of a sequence you can create out of 12 tone scales or any of that. It has to do with your magnetism and your ability to relate and to broadcast a vibe before you even play a note. And it's one of the heavy things that's, I think, lacking from the jazz idiom these days, and it's because people don't have enough time in front of audiences developing what that is. Here you are in university, you're playing for your peers all the time, well, you're kind of gonna be comfortable that way. You're gonna have a rapport with them, they're gonna know who you are, what you usually do, 
what you're practicing, whatever, they can hear that. So there's a certain amount of vibration that's gonna come from playing for the same audience over and over again, but that's kind of the home team. To be able to go out there and have it in you because of experience and your intrepid nature, because I mean, jazz, mu jazz musicians are the ultimate improvisers, so why would, why, why, why can't that sense of in improvisation carry over into how you handle yourself between songs? You see? And I have a certain amount of things I can pull out because of my experience, in case somebody says something from the back row or whatever, and I also have the power of a microphone. But I know that, I know that, see? And a lot of young people don't, you don't, you don't know that because you haven't experienced it and you, you gotta find it out for yourself where your backbone's gonna come from. But all that stuff, so you say, what was the thing that I focused on intensely? I focused on learning the material. I focused on trying to figure out just how, how in God's name did John sing such a line that fast? How did, how come Dexter Gordon's time feels so great every time, and yet the band doesn't slow down? How come, that's the kind of, you know, you want to ask the, those kinds of questions. What, how can, how can I phrase? Even now, I'm working on, because I keep discovering that my phrasing with a band is, it's too clipped, and it's too, I almost want to say it's too precise. I'm so intent on leading the band, which I've had to do throughout, except for times in Ed's band or, you know, like guesting in a couple of occasions, this thing with Branford. I've had to be the band leader the whole time. And for me, that means leading, not just calling the tunes, it means here's the tempo. It's not over here, it's not over here. I'm responsible for that. I'm responsible for making cats aware of dynamic difference. You know, like playing, I need to set that example as a musician, playing what I believe in so that, and listening, so that everybody else does the same thing. If it's just me up there glorifying myself, I'm gonna have a totally different band. I'm not gonna be a jazz musician anymore. I'm gonna be something else. And I wanna be where the jazz people are, because that's the music that I, you know? I listen to I listen to all these 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 ancient records because that's what I love. That's what I fell in love with. I do it because it's a pleasure. Because I want I continue to want to. So when it comes to time feel, I continue to hear stuff when I listen back, and I'm like, you know, man, when are you gonna let go? So I'm consciously consciously trying to phrase behind the beat more and more and more. 52 years old. I'm trying to learn the basic stuff. So. You listen to who you are, you listen to what you don't know, and you try to eliminate your cliches. You try to acknowledge your cliches and eliminate them, and create new cliches. And then you eliminate those. And then you create new, and you eliminate those. You know? Um, and, try, and try not to be lazy. About music. Lazy about others. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Wow, so many things here, man, but I'm trying to consolidate. I guess my question is going to be in regards to like bridging gaps. What I mean by that is, I have my own band, I sing, I play saxophone, and I've always sort of looked at these as separate worlds. Meaning like the difference between focusing on the music as a musician and then being an entertainer. You're talking about the difference between stage pattern and focusing on the music and the requirements of this unmusical, sort of like a separation between I'm a musician and I'm an entertainer on stage. And even watching you when you went to the piano and singing, I sort of have separated myself as a saxophonist where I can pick up my horn. You made me think I'm a horn player. You're, you're standing up and you're singing. This is something I do with my horn, but have felt boxed in as a vocalist to tunes. So my question, I guess, is, Bridging the gap between not only as a vocalist and an entertainer, do you find a balance there, but as an instrumentalist of a saxophone player, at what point did you say, I'm not just going to sing tunes, I'm going to improvise as a singer, I'm going to stand up and just sing? You know, lyrics sort of, like you're saying, can box you into this tune. What are your thoughts on that? 
Well, I mean, I, I wanted to start improvising. Before, uh, I just didn't want to be the guy who just sang the in chorus and then had to wait around for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be participant in the improvisation. Yeah. I mean, you were on a bunch of those gigs, and we went and played the prison, whatever, you know, and, and it's, I didn't want to, you know, like, I mean, as great as it is to hear Ed play, I, I want to do that too. And uh, so let me see what, see, help me see if I can get away with that. And um, it was awful for, I, it was awful for people to have to listen to. And you're in a much better position already because as, a, as an instrumentalist, you already know the kinds of melodies and figures and I, musical ideas that are going to work over a thing. And it's just a question of your voice translating that you know, from the horn back into the voice. Yeah, I think I've blocked that off. Like I've always just, for some reason, put up the wall. I'm going to do this as a saxophone player, and I'm going to turn off entertainment to the audience. And this is a jazz gig versus. No, now I'm a singer. I got to talk to these people. I, but man, you got so much going for you if you have all that musical knowledge in there, and you can sing that stuff to people. Because what happens is, most people can't. They, they don't really hear melodies in the same way that we try to. And they certainly don't hear jazz melodies. They can't, they don't really hear, they don't really hear intricacy. So for, and one of the reasons why is that intricacy has been the domain of instrumentalists by and large. Because singers have been so busy God knows what, singing standards all the time and making money. But if you as a singer can sing the kinds of complicated lines that you know, my, in my experience and my intuition tells me that you're going to really turn some people on to stuff that they didn't even know they could hear before. That's part of the beauty of this whole vocalese project is because now I'm singing stuff that Dexter Gordon played or that Wayne played, and these people never even heard the name. But now they're hearing not only the name, they're hearing the melody, they're hearing a story with it, they're hearing a thing, and then that whole kind of cliche thing that we talk about happening, oh, if I play this, maybe some kid will pick up a record and listen to so-and-so because of me. Were you putting lyrics or were you putting syllables? Like when you started doing that, Okay, when I started scanning, it was okay. just improvisation, and I was just rolling with it, and I didn't know what I was doing, and it was just ear and ignorance. Okay. Um, and the vocalese stuff gave me a leg up in the same way that transcribing anybody's solo is going to give you a leg up. Not only intellectually, but to, to have to sing the exact, you know, uh, intervals. And thank God I had all that classical stuff. I mean, when I was 14 years old, I was the young, dorky kid trying to sing, you know, Karl Orff's Carmina Burana with all the grown-ups. Or I was singing, uh, you know, Brahms' Requiem in the Lutheran Choral Union. Or I, you know, like, I was that kid trying you to figure out that stuff. Your young age. Was that family influence? Well, my dad was a church musician. So, I mean, it was there, and I just wanted to get, And then when I was in college, I was singing Duraflay and crazy Norwegian composers and Poulenc and, you know, stuff that really is like very taxing stuff. Uh, and because of that experience, I, again, came out with a really good vocal technique, none of which had anything to do with a microphone, which is a whole other thing for singers to have to overcome, is that if you grow up singing with a microphone, you don't necessarily develop half the instrument that you conceivably have. To sing to a room of this size without a microphone and to really lay something out, let alone, you know, a, a church or a synagogue or whatever that seats 500 people without a microphone, you got to bring it. And if you never have that demand or uh, opportunity and you think everything is Chet Baker singing My Funny Valentine level of voice, and I, even the other night I was out with Kate McGarry, God bless her. You guys know Kate McGarry singing? Beautiful singer, beautiful, beautiful, and she, uh, this beautiful Irish girl. And, but everything, she's, everything I've ever heard her do, and this wasn't even, I didn't even think of this as a, mm, something that she was going to change. She's no spring chicken. 
I tell you what, she came out the other night, and we were on a thing that we did with we do with Fred Hurst, where he set Walt Whitman to music. And damned if she hadn't developed this whole new way to sing, where she was just big and singing, you know, double forte, and fin and she now be now she's able to finish the phrase with all of her lung capacity. It's just like, whoa, dude. She was a completely new singer, and she still sounded exactly like herself, but I, it was so heroic. But she had never, and the thing with the microphone, it's a drag. People depend on it way too much. That's why I can sing real loud all, whenever, and the microphone is just there to make sure that the drums don't get in my way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm curious about the vocalese, uh, when you take recordings that are so like immortalized, like the Dexter Gordon thing and like Night Dreamer, how that informs your band and how much, I mean, assume, assuming these guys have, like lived with those recordings, you know, how, how much leeway they have when you're like doing this solo to, I guess, interact with you or how much they put those recordings under a microscope and uh, do what the, what the guys are doing originally. Well, I'll tell you, every time I bring something like that to the table, the cats are excited about it. Um, I mean, at this point, it's kind of, it's a little bit of self, it's a self-selecting group, because <laughs> they're in the band. Um, so they, they probably ought to like what I'm doing. Um, but, it, as you say, it's the stuff that they've lived with, it's the stuff that you wish you could have played. And now, in a certain way, I'm giving them a chance to play it in a way that, I mean, I, 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 don't, I never ask anybody to be McCoy, and I never ask anybody to be Elvin. I might, you know, it's like, and pull out your Elvin, but be you, but be you. So I, I try to, because by the time I'm coming out with a thing, my vocalese thing is going to be really locked down, then, as far as I'm concerned, they're at total liberty to do whatever is the most musical choice for them. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, we're all excited about playing that material, and uh, I just try to make choices that are worthy of everybody's time and effort. And if it's not working, then we try it and ditch it. But it works a lot of times. Yeah? Uh, when you were starting out learning standards, or maybe even nowadays, um, would you take one standard and learn, like, you know, Billie Holiday's, the way she sang it, and maybe three versions, or one version, or would you just have she music? What would you recommend? Or? Well, even now, when if I, if I come across something that's for a project, somebody's project or a tune that I want to do or something, then I'll do that. I'll listen, to, I'll, li I'll listen to five or six, you know, whatever numbers of people. And it's so easy now because of iTunes or whatever. You can just hear everything. Uh, um, and sometimes you learn, sometimes, you know, as you know, you learn what not to do. <laughs> I would never do such and such to that tune. That sounds terrible. Um, was it just listening though, or did you actually transcribe it and sing along with them? I would sing, I sang along, I would, I, it, well it depends if it's in my key or not, and how great the recording is. Um, a lot of it, uh, it has to do with just trying to listen to music all the time. Uh, I don't really have to transcribe what singers do by and large. I mean, Bobby McFerrin notwithstanding, <laughs> you can kind of cop what most singers do. You might have to stand a certain way or breathe a little different or really dig deep for something. And like that stuff with John Hendricks, like to sing stuff super fast with lyrics, it's interesting because he could, as I, as I think is probably true of, I can't think of another example, but somebody else in his position I've written stuff that my mouth can do, and I don't know which, which was first, the chicken or the egg. Did I write it because my mouth can do it, or can my mouth do it because I wrote it? But John has some of those where it's like he could do that because he wrote it, and that's probably why I can't do it. 
at least I can't do it yet, or I haven't done the thing with the metronome where you do it slow and then you two notches and you do it, and then two notches and you do it, and two notches and you do it. Um, but some of that I don't touch because it's just like, oh, that's John's. God bless you, John. Um, does that, is that an answer? Yes. Okay. Um, who of the like, living singers now or um, contemporaries of yours are you listening to? Like, who do you love to, to hear? Um, I'm going to be very interested to hear how Jasmia Horn develops. I think she's got a very beautiful, sparkly thing that's also really smart and that has a very strongly developing point of view. Um, because I know how much I was stealing from Mark Murphy early on, I don't really have as much of a hang up with younger singers copying. I mean, that's what we're here to do at first. You want to have a resemblance to Uncle Joe if he's your favorite uncle, <laughs> right? Yeah. And somebody says, oh, you look just like Uncle, or Uncle Joe always, then you feel real good because you love your Uncle Joe. Well, I feel that, I felt that way about Mark and John. And, and so when people say like, oh, that was from that, yeah, it was. Because I want to be part of that family. So I think Jasmia coming out of Betty, that's a perfectly wonderful place to start. Um, uh, remind me of some other people. Oh, it could be like, I said a lot, so if any, it could be like, well, I listen to Cecile a lot. Um, oh yeah, <clears throat> I'm gonna be interested to see how that develops too, because she's so smart. And she, uh, unlike me, she has other marketable skills. She's also a visual, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, she can draw and paint and stuff. And she's obviously a, she's obviously a really smart writer when she writes. Um, I'll be interested to find out how her, how can I say, how much of her emotional investment translates to audiences over time. She's so smart and, you know, I, I, nobody's asking. Yeah, but it's like, it's like intellectually, like, um, maybe you feel like it's maybe. It'd be good to get some like grime up in there. It'd be good <laughs> to get some, but that's just taste. That's yeah. just my taste. I'd like, you know, some grease. Um, I was just wondering, like, in terms of working really hard to try to get where you're trying to go, uh, this might be silly, but like, where does sleep come in? Because, <laughs> you know, you do transcription, you take as many gigs as you can, and you try and go sit in with people who, you, who really matter yeah. to you or whatever, and then it's like, you got to get up at eight or whatever it is, and it's tough because you're getting home at three or four. That's why or you're, whatever. how old are you? 22. Exactly. Right. So do you just like save sleep for when last. you're 35? <laughs> um, man, you just squeeze it in and you try to be smart so you don't blow your chops out or anything like that. I mean, I'll tell you this. Uh, I used to hang super hard and I got two kids and the number of dates I do on the road, I mean, I come back from the road and I have a scotch with some, with some ice and I sit on the couch and I play with my little boy and when it's time for his bed at 8.30 at night, chances are I'm going down with him. <laughs> um, and I fall asleep on airplanes all the time and I, you know, it doesn't get easier. So. I mean, do whatever you got to do now, and you can, you can, your, your recovery time is going to be so much faster than mine that you can make it up in a, in a day or two. So just keep pounding it, and don't drink too much. <laughs> you know, yeah. don't do, don't, don't drink too much, and, and don't, don't get into dumb stuff that's mm -hmm. going to endanger you. Yeah. You know, have adventures, and. Go out back and whatever, but don't, don't let it, don't let it own you. Cause I mean, that, that's that's the shit that happened to Roy, man. And it, he's no longer 
right? So just don't. Drinking is a, it's really hard to not do. Yeah. I was wondering, you talked about growing up singing classical music and then transcribing, listening to records. I was wondering if, and I got here late, so you may have mentioned it before, but I wondered if you do anything extra special in addition to that for ear training and to make sure you hear clearly things you want to sing and like working with that. I don't know what else you can do. I mean, it's hard enough. <laughs> um, I mean, there's been some, there, there are projects that have, oh, I'll put it to you this way, there have been projects that have, writing projects that I have not gotten to yet because they're just too intimidating. Um, there, there's one of the solos from Antibes that Train plays on um, I Want to Talk About You is so heroic and it's plausible. When I say plausible, there are, there are plenty of solos that wouldn't work for a singer to try to sing them. Just because it's too many, it's too much. It's too many notes, it's too many crazy, it's too much. No amount of words are gonna make that work. You'll sound like you're just gibberish. But, there's a couple. And even then, it's just too big. At least for now. Or I don't have enough, I don't have enough substance. That is to say, lyrical substance. Some of these long things, man, you gotta map this stuff out. If a guy's taken, even tr if it's just trained, but he only takes one and a half choruses, and then there's a cadenza, it's, you gotta have so many words. And you, they all have to say something that's valuable. You can't just have stuff that just, re you know, it's trained. You, you, you gotta bring a, 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 an amount of substance that is somehow worthy of that effort. Um, now, one of the Dexter Gordon things, I think I might have sent Body and Soul down to work with the, so the, the, the Body and Soul, that's three full choruses of Body and Soul at a Dexter Gordon tempo. And Body and Soul has an obviously extensive history in people's ear holes about what it's about and what it means. And it already has two or three different lyrics. It's got the original one, it's got the Eddie Jefferson one, it's got the Manhattan Transfer one, who am I to come along with another idea for, and what's that gonna be about? I didn't know until my daughter was born. And that was playing on the iPod in the room when my daughter was born. Dexter Gordon playing Body and Soul, perfect, heaven sent. Now I know what it's about, bam. <coughs> then I could sit down and map it out and have the emotional reservoir and the meaning. To, and then I had to do the stuff you're talking about, get all the notes right. And there's no way to skip that stuff. You either sing the note right or you don't. It's either the interval or it's not at that point. And then you can mess around with them and phrase them and do a thing to them. But there's not a lot of steps you can skip and make it work. Speaking of skipping steps and making yeah, okay. it work, maybe one more, yeah. Any advice regarding like young guys in school with sleep, right? So my question is more to you with having children. I don't know how old your children are. How does being a husband, being a father, play into your your life of being on a job? Are you able to have to share music with your children, or do you look at it like I'm on the road, I come home, and I separate these two things? Oh know, no, man, I'm happy to have them around. No, I mean I. I mean, just like actively, specifically with music. Is I try to play the best stuff, stuff possible for them, okay. and then when I leave, I can't control what they. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Their mother has different tastes. Yeah. <laughs> How old are you kids? I have a 14 year old and a two and a half year old. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have twins that are 13, that's why, right? Yeah, by 13, if you haven't put the music in by then, they may or may not want to hear what you have to say. I have a mixture. My son says he just actually got the note for classical voice, so it's good musical influence mixture. There you go. Everything that <laughs> Wind them up. Let them go. <laughs> uh, I think we're kind of out of time, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Tell, tell us what you're doing tonight. I know you, uh, you have a gig at Snug Harbor. And, and we're doing charts. Them? It's with your it's with your cats, right? Or is it with Oscar, who uh, who is a student here, grad student here? Cool. Amazing pianist, Oscar Wilson, only Jason Weaver, a, a alumnus. 
and uh, Gerald Watkins, who somehow managed to be a great drummer, even though he didn't go to UNO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Kurt, you know. And of course, Amari's playing the sandbar, so uh, how about a hand for Kurt? <laughs> yeah.